Uh, first up, we have Tim Amrine, who is a neuroradiologist at Duke. He is the director of the interventional spine there. And uh, take it away, Tim. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me and see my screen? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, so thank you uh, for the invitation to speak. I'd like to thank Connie and Wouter in particular for the chance to talk to you all today. And so over the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to be reviewing uh, current percutaneous approaches for treatment of CSF leaks. Let me just uh, adjust this. Okay, great. All right. So I have no relevant disclosures, but if I do mention fiber and glue, that's an off-label use of that product. I'm also a medical, a medical advisory board member for the Smile CSF Leak Foundation. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the entire Duke team, um, including Linda, Peter, Mike, Hope, and Jeff for all their contributions. So uh, we know that uh, spinal CSF leaks result in SIH, right? And there's three broad categories. So how do we treat them? Well, you can treat them conservatively uh, with patching or with surgery. And conservative measures include bed rest, hydration, caffeine, and an abdominal binder. And by and large, they don't really work very well. And there are certainly many patients that end up coming to these uh, referral centers that all of us uh, have been talking about. And those uh, methods for treatment at these referral centers involve patching and surgery. Dr. Shevink is gonna be talking more about the surgery piece. And my job is to do sort of introductory discussion about patching. So patching can be conceptualized really as spackling or almost painting. We're basically covering a dural defect uh, in an attempt to try to seal the, the, dural, uh, the dural hole and result in normalization of CSF hydrodynamics. So to understand how patching works, we need to first understand the anatomy. And so in the spine, we have our vertebral column, epidural fat, we have the dura, the CSF, and then the spinal cord. And so when we do uh, a blood patch, what we're basically doing is we are driving a needle into the epidural fat just above the dura, and then uh, delivering our patch material, which most commonly is autologous blood or blood from the IV from a patient. And so who came up with this seemingly crazy idea to fix a CSF leak using the patient's own blood? And, and why did they choose to do that? Well, the first description of an epidural blood patch to treat a CSF leak was by Gormley in anesthesiology in 1960. And uh, he believed that the incidence of postural puncture headache was less in those patients who uh, experienced a bloody lumbar puncture or traumatic tap. And so he treated seven cases of uh, post-lumbar puncture headache with autologous blood. And uh, unfortunately, this publication seems to have gone, on, gone by with a little recognition and the procedure wasn't really widely adopted until a subsequent publication about a decade later by Di, Di Giovanni in anesthesia and analgesia. And this was uh, one of the chiefs of anesthesiology at the US Air Force Base in Lackland. And they published a case series of five post-lumbar puncture headache patients successfully treated with autologous epidural blood patch. And it wasn't until about 17 years later when there was the first reported successful treatment of SIH with an epidural blood patch. Uh, and that was by this author, uh, Philip Brockoger and Peter Brownage. Um, and then uh, now, if we take it to this exact moment, uh, 1235 Pacific time, uh, here during this conversation, we are still using epidural blood patching to treat these leaks. And this has really become sort of the mainstay therapy. And so what are the technical considerations for epidural blood patch? I'm going to talk about this kind of in, in broad strokes. So first, uh, the first choice is, or do we do this blind, meaning the practitioner places the needle without real-time visualization? Uh, and that's typically using palpation and feel. The classic example of that is placing an epidural uh, for childbirth, right? And so they do that obviously without imaging guidance. The alternative method is with imaging guidance. So you direct the needle into the spinal canal with some sort of direct visualization. That's typically uh, fluoroscopy or, or x-ray uh, or CT. And so one of the challenges uh, is that with blind patches, these are generally agreed upon to be suboptimal. And the reason for this, uh, there's a multitude of reasons. In addition to this false loss of resistance concept, so you can, when you're uh, using your palpation, you get loss of resistance greater than 25% of the time, you're actually not in the epidural space. And that's well known about from the literature. And so you end up with malpositioning of the needle and non-target delivery of your patching material. But in addition, without imaging guidance, you don't have the ability to, to visualize some of the unnecessary anatomic structures and confirm that you're in the correct location for patch delivery. So really imaging guidance is sort of the agreed upon uh, better method for doing this. And there's two primary methods to do that. So you do it under fluoroscopy using x-ray here, which I'm showing you here on the right, uh, and CT. 
Uh, CT uh, is what we use at Duke. Uh, it does allow for placement of the needle in some places that uh, are not really otherwise readily accessible under flora. We'll see that in the talk later, but by and large, the approaches are, are quite similar. Then uh, we need to talk about two different approaches. So uh, considerations here, either the targeted or non-targeted approach. So a non-targeted approach places the needle for injection of the patching material without concern for the actual location of the CSF leak. So it's more of a shotgun approach. You're just putting your patching material in there and hoping that you're covering uh, a leak, whether it's a cult or otherwise. A targeted approach uh, involves placement of the needles immediately adjacent to the site of the CSF leak. And by necessity, this requires myelographic imaging or some sort of imaging to determine the exact leak site so you can then target it. We can also have considerations for what type of products we're doing uh, to use the patching. So what patch material? So the traditional one is autologous blood where you acquire by a sterile technique in an IV, the patient's own blood and then inject that through the needle into the epidural space. Uh, more recently, there has been uh, the use of these fibrin glue products, uh, which were originally designed for things like bowel anastomosis and, and other purposes, but then were used in open neurosurgical procedures. And now we have versions that can be used and injected through the needle. So do you use just blood? Do you use just fibrin glue? Do you use, use them uh, in combination? Does it matter? What order should it be? And uh, what provides the best efficacy? These are questions that are yet to be answered, but many of us do use the fibrin glue because we think it imparts uh, better efficacy. And so here's how a fibrin glue patch works. You get, and uh, you end up with two syringes. So one with fibrinogen, factor eight, fibronectin, a protonin, plasminogen. The other one has a combination of thrombin and calcium chloride. And when these two uh, solutions mix, they end up making fibrin monomers or the so-called glue. And here's what it looks like under the microscope on the right. It's actually very similar to physiologic fibrin. By way of kind of understanding what this looks like in, in real life, right? Here's an example of a picture from a surgical tray at Duke, right? And we've got uh, our two preloaded syringes with those uh, solutions, they come together through this Y connector. This is what our tray looks like in general. So we've got um, our lidocaine needle to, to numb the skin. We've got our uh, spinal needles that we're gonna use in order to place them in the appropriate location. We use a little bit of contrast to make sure we're in the right spot. And then we inject our blood and our fibrin glue. Okay, great. So let's move on to uh, some different types of leaks that we might treat. And we'll start with the iatrogenic leak. And so uh, the classic one is treating a post lumbar puncture headache, right? And so the CSF leak can occur when you drive the needle into the CSF space. Uh, by necessity, you have to pierce the dura. And so you can leave behind a hole. You're more likely to leave behind a hole if you use a larger needle, so a lower gauge, uh, or if you use a needle that's a, a cutting tip, like a quinky tip needle, as opposed to an atraumatic needle like the Gertie Marks needle. Um, and so here's what we do to treat those. So uh, here's some anatomy on the CT. We have our ligamentum flavum. We have our epidural fat, which is our target to cover the dura because the dura is here on that hash line there, the fecal sac. And so here's a real life case. We've driven the needle up into the ligamentum flavum using CT fluoroscopy. We're in that location, we connect our contrast, advance it, and then we get loss of resistance. We see contrast epidurogram in the dorsal epidural space, and we follow that up with our patching material. Now, uh, one thing that's not often thought about is when you do a lumbar puncture, sometimes you can drive the needle a little bit too far forward and you can actually pierce the ventral dura as well. And we get patients that are referred to our center for post LP headaches that are refractory to uh, initial patches. And we think that's because actually the hole is along the ventral aspect of the dura. In order to treat that, you actually need to do a 360 degree patch. And so here's an example of that. So here we're running the needle up. And under CT guidance, we can drive it between the nerve root, which is over here, and uh, the lateral aspect of the dura. And you can see we can get some nice spread of contrast material and then subsequently patching material over the ventral dural surface. This often requires a bilateral approach with straight needles, which I'll get into in a, a little bit later. Uh, but this is, this is the way that we treat these ventral leaks, and this is a necessary in many patients. Okay, moving on to SIH. We know that there's the three flavors of C spinal CSF leak in SIH, and we'll talk first about the type one or nerve root sleeve diverticular leak. Here's what they look like. Uh, here's a coronal CT myelogram. You can see a leak here coming from the axilla of the nerve root. Uh, here's a, another case is what this looks like, right? Here's a little bit of contrast leaking from that axilla. And so here's how we, how we treat these. We're taking a posterior oblique approach under CT fluoroscopy and placing the needle immediately posterior to the nerve root in question where we know the leak is coming from. Once we're in that position, we're using a little bit of contrast. We use ICU 200M at our institution. Uh, and then after that, we're going to use autologous blood. We're going to inject it through the needle, and you can kind of see that darker uh, stuff here, that lower density uh, material. That's the blood, and then that's going to create the patch. So here's a real-life case. Uh, this was a, a young woman who came down 
uh, from the Northeast for treatment. Uh, this person had a left T11 nerve root sleeve leak that you can see here on a dynamic myelogram, the contrast spilling out, confirming the leak. We use a very high tech technique for demarcating the vertebral body of taping a paper clip to the patient's back. And so uh, this is how we treated her leak. So here, uh, posterior oblique approach, we're gonna basically put our needle immediately adjacent to the leak as you're seeing here, injecting our contrast, confirming we're in a safe space and then go ahead and put in our patch material here. We use both fibrin glue and blood in order to get a, a really durable response. You can see we did two separate needle placements here at two different levels to get a really excellent spread around that uh, T11 nerve root sleeve. And she was successfully treated with this patch. All right, moving on to our next flavor of leak, and that's the type two or osteophyte spur. So here you've got a spur that penetrates the ventral dura, creating a large volume CSF leak. This is a patient where contrast was leaking out all over the place on the CT myelogram. We did some high temporal resolution dynamic imaging, and you can see the split of contrast here at this particular level, indicating that that's the location of the leak. Here's a slide courtesy of Dr. Shevink, where there's all these intraoperative appearances. I bet you'd see a couple of those in his talk as well. And they, uh, this, this is what these things look like. And this is a real life case. So this is a case where we did an ultra fast dynamic CT myelogram. And we can see that there's a split of the contrast right at this disc level here. You can see the contrast leaking out into the leak, confirming that this is where the ventral defect was. So how do we treat these things? Well, here we're up in the thoracic spine and we've got to find a, run, a way to run our needle up past the spinal cord and into the ventral epidural space in order to deliver our, our blood for the patch, which can be quite challenging. In fact, one of the difficulties is that with straight needles, it's very difficult to get the needle any further than the ipsilateral third of the ventral epidural space. And as a result, this can be challenging to deliver patching material to the middle third. And so, you know, based on this unmet need, our group has been working on creating a new device for that. And so, so our goal here is to create a, a needle with a nitinol curved wire that can basically deliver material all the way across. This is not clinically available yet, but we're, we're seeing some really excellent uh, results in preclinical studies. This is what this looks like with straight needle approaches. This can be a, this is not for the faint of heart. We are driving the needle up here. The dura is right here. The spinal cord is in there and we have to run it past the nerves and the arteries there in the foramen in order to achieve access to the ventral epidural space. It currently requires bilateral placements of the needles in order to get this done. This is what it looks like. Um, since you're driving past uh, arteries that are in the foramen, it is important to note where those are located. And in particular, some of those arteries uh, are, are actually radicular medullary arteries and provide um, blood supply to the cord. And so you can end up with cord injury. So it's important to note that most of the arteries are located in the superior and anterior aspect of the nerve foramen. So whenever possible in placing these needles, we try and come in along the inferior aspect of the foramen. Okay, finally, we've got our CSF to venous fistula, which is our third type of leak, right? And so here, as we already have probably talked about, right? We've got our CSF that is uh, directly coming from around a nerve root sleeve and into an adjacent paraspinal vein, allowing for unregulated egress of uh, CSF back into the uh, bloodstream and resulting in intracranial hypotension. And so on this case here, let me go back to this. So this case was uh, a really excellent example of a very uh, very large and obvious CSF to venous fistula arising from the anterior aspect of this nerve root sleeve diverticulum. And this was the treatment uh, video for this case. So here we're making an approach that's actually quite analogous to what we just did to treat that nerve root sleeve diverticularly. But here we're trying to target also where the fistula arises from the uh, nerve root sleeve. And so uh, here we, you're gonna see the needle placement comes out laterally and we're trying to get uh, ex uh, excellent spread of uh, patching material in and around that area, because you can see some of these uh, more anterior approaches here. And uh, Dr. Mamluk is going to talk about uh, his center's approach and how they treat some of these fistulas later. So, okay, to summarize, here are the three primary needle approaches uh, for patching under CT guidance, right? We have our transforaminal approach, our interlaminar approach, and then this ventral epidural approach. Variations on these themes are employed for more challenging cases. And here's a couple of examples. We sometimes will need to go through the facet joint in order to get to particular leaks. And so we've done that before. Here's an example where we've gone through a costovertebral joint, traversing that in the upper thoracic spine in order to get to a leak. And then finally, uh, here's a really incredible case where uh, Linda went through the uncovertebral joint um, in order to get to a ventral uh, cervical leak here in order to, to patch a patient. So that's a pretty incredible case and things that uh, really CT helps you kind of do these unique and novel procedures.
Fluoro, uh, here are the approaches for fluoro and what they look like. They're really analogous, right? So here's uh, an interlaminar approach, and then here is a transferaminal approach as well. Whenever we're placing our uh, needle, we need to make sure that we're not intravascular. So intravascular injection is going to have two problems. The first is you're going to have a non-target injection, right? You're not, your patching material is going to go systemic rather than staying in and around the leak. And the second is if you're injecting fiber and glue, the A-protein can lead to an allergic reaction. And so we don't want to have that happen. And so when we're looking for intravascular injection on CT, we're doing something called the double tap technique. We're using fluoro. We step on this pedal to acquire the image. You can see the little bit of contrast there that's curvilinear on the lateral aspect of the nerve root. We take a second picture one to two seconds later after the injection of contrast and you see that it washes out. This is what this looks like in real life. Uh, so here you're seeing flashing of contrast out there. This is a lot more apparent when you're sitting at the scanner because the video is running a bit fast. But uh, yeah, you'll see another little area where there's a flash of contrast there in the anterior vein. So that's how we know we're intravascular. Here are some of the places that you need to look. These can occur in the foramen. They can occur in the anterior soft tissues, uh, as shown there. They can occur in the vertebral body or in the basi vertebral plexus, posteriorly in the paraspinal musculature and even contralateral. So we need to kind of be aware of all these locations where you might get the vascular flash of contrast necessitating uh, a changing of the positioning of your needle. Okay, here's what this looks like under conventional fluoro. So here you're injecting and we're seeing a pretty, pretty obvious appearance of uh, multiple uh, areas of veins that are being uh, taking up the contrast. Here's a, a couple other examples of that as well. And so one question I often get when teaching this or having these conversations is people will ask, well, you know, how, how do you, when do you stop? How much is, is too much? And I think you really need to take all of these different things into consideration when determining how much patch material to inject. So we need to cover the leak, right? And so we're going to do that through direct visualization. Uh, I like to put a little bit of contrast in the blood so I can kind of see where it's spreading and make sure I'm covering and appropriately painting where I uh, assume the hole to be. Uh, we also would like to put in as much volume as we can. There's some evidence, uh, I would say weak evidence in the literature that the larger volume of patching material imparts greater efficacy. Of course, that may be the case for non-targeted patches and may not be necessary for a targeted patch, but we'd like to put in more volume if we can. On the other side, uh, we need to consider patient pain and discomfort and uh, God forbid deficits, right? We really do not want to have any deficits. And so we want the patient to be relatively awake and conversive with us uh, during the procedure in order to make sure that they're doing okay. And then finally, mass effect. And so one of the things that's really nice with CT is we can kind of take a look here and see what the progressive mass effect is. And that's the benefit of imaging guidance. So here we're doing an interlaminar approach and you can see that there's an increase in size of the amount of uh, uh, contrast and patching material here uh, to the point where we're kind of really effacing the CSF space here. And you can imagine that we're going to get into cord compression if we keep going. And so we, here's where we're going to stop and the patient did quite well. So usually I would say we inject about two to five cc's when we do a transfrontal approach around a nerve root and more like uh, five to 20 cc's if we're doing an interlaminar approach or central. But again, this is dependent on all of these different factors. So I think I'm running up against time. So in conclusion, uh, epidural blood patching is really the first line treatment and current standard of care for treatment of SIH and uh, CSF leaks in general. Remember, we talked about imaging versus blind. We're gonna use an imaging approach when we can. I think there's important questions about whether targeting matters and uh, also whether or not fiber and glue matters. And we talked about how there are different treatment approaches based on the leak subtype, be it iatrogenic, covering the ventral surface for viscosity of pipe spurs and refractory L posterior puncture headaches, and how to treat these CSF degrees fistulas and nerve roots leave that reticular roots. Thanks so much for your time and attention. I appreciate it.